Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this program hosted by the Brennan Center for Justice, the National Parks of New York Harbor Conservancy at Federal Hall and NYU's John Bradamus Center. I'm John Avalon, a CNN political, senior political analyst and anchor, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to talking with the next group of panelists about one of the really core issues of our time. 20 years after 9-11, what will it take to keep us and our freedoms safe? Now, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping measures to keep in mind. First, we're going to leave time for your questions at the end of the discussion. If you have a question you want to ask, please just add them via the YouTube chat box. Or, and, and we'll we'll move forward and get to them in the last 20 or so minutes of the panel. And second, we do provide a live closed captioning. Um, now, let's talk about the program ahead. 20 years after 9-11, in the wake of the exit from Afghanistan, there's a lot of debate about America's role in the world, what our foreign policy posture should be. A lot of lessons learned and a lot of still very open debate, not only for the Biden administration, but uh, for our country as a whole. And we've got a very expert panel of folks with diverse perspectives, uh, and I want to introduce them to you one by one. First, we've got Spencer Ackerman, who's been covering the war on terror since 2002. He is the publisher of the Forever Wars uh, journal on Substack and the author of the excellent new book, Reign of Terror, How 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Jane Harmon is the president emerita of the Wilson Center, serving nine terms in Congress as a representative from California's 36th district. Uh, she was active in national security affairs while in Congress, to say the least, and she is the author of Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Confront Hard National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe. Faisal Patel is the director of the Brennan Center Liberty and National Security Program. She's testified before Congress on many occasions, particularly focused on surveillance of Muslims, and national security and counterterrorism issue. Finally, Elizabeth Shackelford, a senior fellow at uh, foreign, U.S. Foreign Policy at the Chicago Council of Global Affairs. She was a career diplomat in the State Department until 2017, when she resigned in protest of the Trump administration's policies. And she is the author of The Dissent Channel, American Diplomacy in a Dishonest Age. It is great to have you all here. This is a vital and going to be a very vibrant conversation. And while I want to make sure we address the mistakes of the past as much as possible, I want to pivot forward to the direction we should take at going forward as a country. And so, Jane, I want to begin with you because you've had real world experience in Congress. You've admitted some of the mistakes that you participated in, you know, and, and that your colleagues did. But looking forward, First, do you think that with the draw of Afghanistan, that the era of American interventionism is over? And what should be the driving light for America's foreign policy in the future? Okay. Well, first, John, let me salute you. I've known you a long time, and I think your uh, commentary on you know to, on the tube and everywhere is very valuable. And Thank you. you try to speak truth to the rest of us. And let me also congratulate uh, the co-authors or the other authors on this call. Uh, being here gave me a chance to read their excellent books. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I think they came courtesy of John. Thank you for that. Uh, in, in terms of uh, where we are and looking forward, I, I always say if I weren't an optimist, why would I have served nine terms in the United States Congress? Uh, I am an optimist. And I do think that America is still the, the republic that we started with, which you know we have to keep. Uh, is a fragile and an admirable thing. Going forward, we have to do something we haven't been able to do since the Cold War ended, a point in my book called Insanity Defense, which is to uh, reflect and respect both our values and our interests. What are our values? Our values are that we are a democratic country. We respect the rule of law. We respect uh, human rights. I'm not saying we always do this, but this is what our, th these are our values. Uh, and uh, we are uh, hopefully open to people from the rest of the world coming to live in, and thrive here. Those are some of them anyway. What are our interests? Our interests, it seems to me, are uh, protecting the security of our country, which has been under some threat. We can debate that. Uh, but, but understanding that the world is a different world and that we are not the sole unipower and the way we want to do things is not always the way they should be done. And uh, I think that uh, working with allies is a very good start and we have a lot of work to do there. But I also um, think that um, welcoming others 
uh, and sharing power uh, going forward is something we have to do and we have to do it well. And hopefully what ends up happening is that we uh, end up in a stronger position, not a weaker position. And final comment, uh, projecting our, our soft power is where we start, uh, not our hard power. And we've made a lot of mistakes. That's in my book. And I know the others on this call agree with me. Uh, uh, if we project soft power, which will require uh, restoring the State Department, but also connecting our government more effectively to all the NGOs and others who have played such a vital role in, in trying to help those in Afghanistan at the end of this uh, military mission, uh, I think uh, we have a very good chance uh, to be a, a much better actor in the world and a, and a much more secure country. Uh, Spencer, you know, your book, and I want to give you a chance to articulate the, the core thesis, but it traces the mistakes the nation made in the wake of 9-11 and how it led to Donald Trump. And you had a great op-ed in the Times about how it, you, you felt it even led to the environment that created January 6th. But I want you, after you re-articulate re your thesis, to talk about the kind of foreign policy you hope and believe the nation should pursue going forward as a practical matter. Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to everyone on this panel. Thanks to Brennan, uh, Federal Hall, NYU. And it's great always to talk with you, John, my former editor at the Daily Beast. Um, to give the kind of nickel version of my book, uh, the basic argument, um, which I try and demonstrate through my reporting over the years, more so than, than argue, is that the war on terror is a democratic emergency, that throughout the persistence of a war, um, however ostensibly focused overseas, the war is also taking place at home in the United States against a definable non-white enemy that very quickly opens the door to a lot of deeply uh, disturbing, violent, lawless, and frankly racist currents of American history. And under the uh, rubric of a patriotic national emergency, those forces have a pathway back to power. Um, we see that with the culmination of Donald Trump, but Trump and Trumpism are kind of laced throughout um, the, the war on terror. What do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is both from uh, a perspective of deforming the institutions necessary to safeguarding American freedom through uh, the Patriot Act, through uh, the lawless and ultimately ratified uh, mass surveillance conducted by the NSA, uh, through the transformation of immigration into a counterterrorism context, and through the acquiescence in so many different ways of the judicial branch of uh, the government um, in whatever uh, a presidency that becomes more like an elected king says is in the interests of national security, all end up badly eroding the structures that many Americans will come to see during the Trump administration. They wished operated more like robust safeguards on American democracy and American freedom. Uh, going forward, I think we need to be guided by uh, one very fundamental principle first, which is to do no harm. Um, the United States, we don't often talk about this in these terms, probably because it's so wrenching, but a very conservative estimate uh, by Brown University's Costs of War Project has the United States being responsible for the deaths of over 900,000 human beings, people with souls like you and me. Uh, since 9-11, the creation of tens of millions of refugees. All of these sorts of things are active harms that aren't unfortunate consequences um, or side effects of American foreign policy, but the inevitable and predictable consequences of an American foreign policy that operates as if it has the right to police the world, to set terms for the world. The United States has to learn not to do that. It has to create structures that it recognizes do not only bind the rest of the world, but bind it. That what's called the rules based, what Washington likes to call the rules based international order, is an order that has to substantively bind the United States, not reflect its prerogatives. I believe the most urgent task in pursuing that kind of goal is to abolish 
in totality the war on terror. That is to say, not only the operations, but the authorities that get set up after 9-11 that allow the presidency to become something that we would recognize more as an elected king. And I'll kick it to the others uh, so I don't take up too much time. Well, I, I have a, a lot of, I'll follow, I want to follow up with you on, but we will have time in this conversation. Uh, Fies, I mean, that leads to one of your core themes that you, you write about, which is um, the expansion and the abuse of the surveillance state in the wake of 9-11. Um, now, uh, you know, one of the things about the attack on our nation and our, our reaction to it, separating the Iraq war, which is, is, is I think, near, near, near consensus at this point, mistake and overreach. Um, you know, there, there was and, and remains a terrorist problem in the world. Now, we can argue whether we should be treating people as primarily criminals or whether we make a mistake by elevating the combatants. But what do you think the right balance is uh, on, on, on surveillance? And do you think actually, as, as Spencer indicated, that there, there may be a bipartisan moment uh, to, to do fundamental reforms of things like FISA courts because the, the far right has recently gotten more up in arms in the, about them as well. So I think since Spencer is exactly right in that I think counterterrorism has distorted our foreign policy because it has been the driving force of pretty much everything we do overseas from Asia to the Arab world to Africa. And at the same time, counterterrorism has also distorted our internal laws and rules. And as a result, we have built up this huge surveillance structure, which you know, is meant to prevent terrorism, but actually gathers in all kinds of information about everyday Americans doing everyday things. Um, the problem is though, that you know, when you talk about you know, a bipartisan consensus for reform, we've been there before, we've been pretty close um, in earlier times to um, actually curtailing surveillance programs. And some surveillance programs, like the NS some of the NSA surveillance programs, have in fact either lapsed or been pulled back because the NSA wasn't able to play by the rules. But at the end of the day, we haven't had leadership, frankly, that pushes for this kind of surveillance reform. And that's something that we very desperately need. The other thing I think that's really important for us to think about is the different ways in which surveillance is happening. We're sort of used to this idea of the government being the biggest surveillance threat, but private actors have become a huge surveillance threat as well, often acting in concert, not just with the FBI or the NSA, but with police departments across the country. So we face a very um, severe but complicated surveillance landscape now that's going to take a lot of work to actually bring under control. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, it, what you're describing is obviously we, we have we have we've surveillance capitalism on layered on top of uh, issues uh, of, of excess in, in the U.S. government. Um, and they are difficult to untangle. But what I'm not hearing is any particular optimism on your part. Not well, the, <laughs> well, I am an optimist on this because I think one of the things that I've seen over particularly the last decade is um, a really much more pervasive recognition of the harms of uh, invasions of privacy um, and particularly when it comes to technology. I mean, we've all certainly seen the, the backlash against the tech giants. And in an interesting way, I think COVID has... Um, actually heightened those concerns as a wider range of people become concerned about their privacy and their medical information. And I understand that a lot of these people are people who uh, take positions that I don't agree with in terms of anti-vaccine and anti-masking and things like that. But for a long time, concerns about privacy had been really limited to like two groups. So minority groups and protesters or people who felt that they were on the outs with the sources of power, um, and then a, a sort of a cohort of liberal progressive folks who just were suspicious of government mm -hmm. power. And now you have this, you know, additional dynamic. I think that's that's playing in about an additional constituency in the United States that's 
very wary of, of government power. Now, usually the way these things work out is that people are like, well, go spy on him, but not on me. Yeah. Uh, and that's a difficult dynamic to get over. But that's something I think that does give me hope. And the fact that actually the United States has an incredibly vibrant civil society that has been organized and pushing back against these initiatives for a very long period of time. Um, Elizabeth, you served the State Department for a long time, and, and yet your book is a blistering critique in many respects of um, this culture of, of dishonesty and distortion, misinformation that was fed to the American people. And you've written about the Washington Post's Afghanistan Papers series and, 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 and the way that um, that impulse to not tell the truth to the American people compounded Afghanistan and fracts was sort of a redux of Vietnam. You were a part of the State Department for a very long time. Um, do you think that, how, how does one go about reforming that culture of secrecy, that culture of misinformation um, that seems to be marrow deep, uh, at least judging by Afghanistan and Vietnam? Well, I'd start by saying it's important to recognize that it's not just dishonesty to, you know, to the American people and to the outside. It's, it's frequently the problem is dishonesty to ourselves, what we're telling ourselves, both inside the State Department and within our military. We're making cases that, um, you know, to ourselves to make things sound as though we're on a better track than we are. You, you have both of these. You have people who understand on the inside and are, um, and are relaying something else uh, externally. And then you have people who are just lying to ourselves, which is what I saw frequently uh, when I was posted in places like South Sudan and Somalia. So I guess I'm one of the few people on this call who's not particularly optimistic about, <laughs> about our ability to uh, actually not just learn those lessons, but but change moving forward. And I'd say one of the biggest challenges is inertia. Our um, the inertia really tends to drive what we do, and it's easier to kind of pull the wool over over your eyes and the eyes of the American public than to actually change. But moving forward, I think that we do have that greater awareness in the American public. And my hope is that there is a, a kind of a press and a push from the public, from Congress, from other places where they can really. Uh, require more oversight to be involved. And I think that's going to be necessary to answer those hard questions. But if we can be honest with ourselves about how this short-term focus on short-term security and stability issues is undermining all of our other longer-term initiatives, um, I think that's the only way that we're going to overcome it. But it's not going to happen internally without some push from from Congress and you know other places where there is real oversight. Extra, I want you to just extrapolate on that last point for a second, the, the long-term interest versus the impulses of, of, of the departments. So even with your, uh, I mean, I'm a big advocate of giving uh, more power and influence to our career uh, personnel in the State Department, because I think that they tend to have a longer term view than a lot of our political actors. But that said, even, even on the inside with your career folks, they are still um, kind of hamstrung by our, you know, four year and two year election cycles, because you want to be able to deliver and show what you've done. So one uh, concrete example outside the Afghanistan realm, which I know everyone's been talking about is, you know, in South Sudan, there was this interest of just keeping things stable enough until, you know, the next administration comes in, rather than making hard decisions to try and uh, kind of push our friends. I'm talking about early on in the war in Afghanistan, and in, I'm sorry, in South Sudan, kind of 2013, 2014, when we probably could have pressed for peace in a place that doesn't have significant American national security interests by any means. But even in a case like this, where we should have been able to make some hard calls and hard decisions and admit that the people we had empowered there were, were not good guys, um, you know, we weren't able to do it there because there was this pressure not to have a big, um, uh, not to have a big foreign policy mess, um, you know, that the White House had to face ahead of uh, the next incoming election. So if we're not able to do that in a place like South Sudan, which really is not um, very big in the news and is not a high level priority for uh, American national security, it's no wonder that we have such trouble making these decisions uh, with places like Afghanistan. Jane, let's talk about the lessons of, of Afghanistan. Um, because, I mean, look, for, for a long time, America looked to the occupations of Germany and Japan and said, see, you know, we can stabilize a nation in defeat. We can help build it back up. We can change its trajectory and even create an ally. Separating out the, the enormous distraction uh, with air quotes around it of Iraq, which diverted strategic attention, resources, et cetera. Um, 20 years is a long time. Uh, maybe a short time in the context of Afghanistan, but it's, it's, it's a long time. It evidently didn't work. So what are the lessons that someone who is more of an internationalist in, in, in uh, uh, your foreign policy perspective can take 
um, from from that failure? Well, I have a lot of things to say, and I agree in many ways with the others on the panel. And by the way, Elizabeth, I salute you for your service uh, for you know decades. You're the kind of person we need in government. Uh, the global war on terror was misnamed. Terror is not an enemy; it's a tactic. And you know there still is terrorism in the world, including in our own country. Um, let's understand, and it's gotten worse in some respects because of some of the things we've done. Uh, we also, at the beginning, I'm just pointing out, thought we'd be attacked again. This includes everybody. Uh, Barbara Lee was the only dissenter, and I salute her, and I like her a lot, on the authorization to use military force. But most of us, th most of us thought we would be attacked again and tried to put in place policies, many of which were the wrong policies, I say that in the book, uh, to keep us safer. A huge problem, and this relates to Afghanistan, is Congress. My last chapter is the incredible shrinking Congress. What happened to Congress? Congress passed the AUMF, which wasn't perfectly drafted, but is the threadbare justification for all these wars and uh, military missions since. Uh, and Congress has done nothing about this except to keep funding this. So that's a problem, and it's a huge problem going forward. And it was a huge problem on Afghanistan. Congress's oversight wasn't there. And uh, my view, and I think we all agree, is that we overstayed the mission, we, we over-militarized the mission, and the problem is now that uh, extricating ourselves was messy and we're not fully ex extricated and we're doing other stuff around the world using military tools. So I, 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 I think uh, looking at Afghanistan, Biden made the right decision. Uh, we can look at whether the implementation was perfect. I don't know what's perfect. I mean, as a mother of four, I always say perfection is not an option. Uh, but And there's a lot to look at. Yeah. Um, but I think his head was in the right place. And I think he was impatient, properly so, because of two decades of being told, just stay a little longer, add a few more folks, and this will go well. And apologies for one second. I absolutely have to get off this screen. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Drop the mic. Spencer, um, you know, I know you you, you and I have spoken uh, uh, about your, your book, and you think that Biden basically did the right thing with regard to Afghanistan, but probably didn't go far enough um, with regard to the totality of the war on terror. That said, uh, do you advocate... What, what might be called a non-interventionist or more isolationist foreign policy going forward? Is that where your beliefs and reporting have led you philosophically? Well, I think it's a mistake to consider an isolationist. Uh, what I think um, in kind of a broad view, and you know, I'm not a policymaker or an academic, I'm a, I'm a reporter, um, but uh, what I want to see removed um, from American foreign policy uh, is militarism and uh, the American exceptionalism that says the United States has the right to order the world as it would like, has the right to police the world, even if you know the the wisdom of this or that you know intervention makes sense. And the reason why I don't think it's real, it really works to call this an isolationist perspective, is because what that sort of two things happen there. Um, first. The right way to organize the world, if I can be on a soapbox uh, for a moment, is collectively. It is to make sure something that doesn't pertain today actually does pertain, which is that meaningful democracy, scaling up from a local level to a national level to an international perspective, actually applies. The reason why people rightly suspect and distrust international architectures that are supernatural is because they have no meaningful democratic authority and accountability over them. That has to change. The reason why it has to change is not just because of the inherent um, rights of all of us to decide how we conduct our business in concert with the rest of us. It's because we have gotten very recently, ongoing today, real reminders that the actual threats that humanity faces are not threats that can be mitigated or addressed entirely um, by nations. That national security, I think fundamentally, is a misnomer and it distracts from what actually does damage and threaten human beings, not the interests of the states internationally that 
um, so-called you know, national interests seek to safeguard. Um, what I mean by that is that we have now seen from the pandemic to the manifested climate emergency, mm -hmm. the United States on its own, no nation on its own, can handle what are going to be compounding and coalescing challenges of the future that will build on global public health, human migration, um, and the increasing um, driving force of international capital towards destabilizing and jeopardizing those human futures. All of these things have to be dealt with democratically. Right, okay. Um, obviously we don't, I, I wanna stay with you for this because it's fascinating. Um, you know, I, I thought maybe there was some glimmer of, of, of overlap between, um, you know, Rand Paul and 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 libertarians uh, often bristle at the term isolationist. They prefer non-interventionist. But what you're what you're talking about, obviously, we don't live in a lowercase d democratic world. Um, uh, but what you seem to be saying is actually uh, more collective solutions through uh, multilateral uh, bodies. What, what are you imagining? The UN, or what? What? What is the mechanism that would create that world uh, well, that you're yeah. imagining? Well, look, you know, again, I don't have like 10 point policy programs or anything like that. That's just not the, the way I work. But um, the thing to do first is to increase democratic accountability. Foreign policy is an elite enterprise. Foreign policy is conducted, debated, executed and instrumentalized by what essentially amounts to, you know, an elite class of Americans. And I think that is an enormous mistake that uh, the mechanisms of foreign policy have to be made more democratic. It's, it's well and good to talk about congressional oversight, but typically congressional oversight runs toward the mean, which is that either unelected, uh, either unelected um, people within the security state um, for technocratic purposes have to take greater control or you know, often venal uh, political appointees have to take control. I think ultimately what we need to do is expand who is invested in American foreign policy toward a greater body of Americans and then provide similarly for those mechanisms of international architecture, greater democratic accountability, not just from uh, an American perspective, but from a global perspective. Okay, I see Jane is desperately trying yeah. to get in. I feel like you also, Elizabeth needs to, needs to respond to that as well. Jane? You first. But, you know, I guess as a member of the swamp or the incredible elite, I just have a couple of things to offer. And one is that that uh, you are partially right that the nation state cannot uh, handle a whole range of issues that have developed since the Treaty of Westphalia, which was you know a few centuries back, and uh, certainly including terrorism, uh, the and and pandemics and the modern economy, those might be three, uh, and that mechanisms to handle those have to be rethought. And I don't actually think, I think most people agree that our international mechanisms at the moment are adequate either. Uh, and the private sector has surged into this world and has mechanisms that governments don't have and can't, can't uh, protect against. But, but I still think, just to go back to Congress, and maybe, uh, you know, I don't want to have to think that I, I didn't try. Uh, Congress is the mechanism through which the public speaks. The public elects members of Congress on two-year cycles, I'm talking about the House, and that's a pretty short leash. And a problem is, you know, who votes and gerrymandering, I get all that yep. stuff. But if Congress exercised more effective oversight, the public would have a voice and what you call this elitism uh, would would be uh, substantially diluted. All right, expand Congress, reform redistricting. Uh, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. um, sure. you know, uh, you resemble uh, uh, Spencer's remarks to some extent, um, although you're a critic of your former uh, institution. But I, I, I I'll give, want to give you a chance to respond if you feel so inspired. But again, I, I want to press on this. What does this better world where we've learned the lessons looked like, given that whether we like it or not, I mean, Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, maybe reconfiguring within the, the Taliban. Uh, you know, you talk to people in the New York City, you know, police department, you know, I mean, we've, there have been over 50 uh, attacks thwarted, well, well over 50, actually, in, in, in New York City alone, not in the scale of 9-11, but, 
you know, that's a reality. Now, there's one can argue this should not be dealt with as anything other than a criminal uh, issue. But but what are the mechanisms uh, that, that you think we should be um, investing in? What is the structure that can can take the lessons learned and apply them going forward as a practical matter? Well, I'll start by saying I'm both a, a critic and a big advocate of my former employer. The State Department, I think, needs has a big role to play in a lot of the business. But getting back to you know, what comes next, because I think that that's the right question to be asking right now. Um, I think if you listen to a lot of what President Biden has been saying, um, it touches directly on much of what both Spencer and, and Jane have referenced here. Uh, less use of military force is our you know, tool of first resort. President Biden has said that multiple times. Relying on relentless diplomacy, President Biden has said this many times. Um, and you know, working with all of the tools in the foreign policy toolbox and the domestic toolbox, by the way, because a lot of those uh, those um, potential attacks that were thwarted were probably not thwarted primarily by military intervention happening overseas. Probably a lot of that is intelligence and, and working together with law enforcement. But I think what we need to do first in order to move forward um, positively and better in the future is to assess what the effective and ineffective parts of the war on terror were. And I think that if we did a real accounting of that, we would find that much of what we did did not actually help with that kind of one metric that we hear about the war on terror, which is we haven't had attacks here at home. But we would learn that a lot of what we did uh, worsened the terrorism situation across the world. We need to be able to divide which parts did which, and we won't do that until we have an honest accounting of the impact of what we have done. And what, I will, what? Uh, well, what worked? I And I'm not sure that we know. I do have a very strong sense of what didn't work. And the entire American public and world saw a bit of that a couple of weeks ago with our errant er er strike in Kabul that killed a bunch of civilians. And that is one strike that happened while the world was, was watching. Mm -hmm. Nine, some 90,000 strikes have happened during the war on terror. How many of those did nothing to make us safer, but helped foster and feed uh, the case of our enemies? So I think we need to learn that so that we can move ahead and use the right tools to help our security and not contribute uh, to right. growing violence. All right, Spencer, I, I know that's a particular issue of passion for you, but Faisal, uh, you've got your hand up first, so shoot. Unmute, please. There we go. Thank you. Nope. Good. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, good. Um, I think you know one of the things that that we need to think about is well, what does security mean, right? So we talk about national security, and national security is is kind of hard to define. But every time we want to prioritize something, whether it's climate change or um, or dealing with um, I don't know, other issues, we talk about it in the context of national security. And I think that's really a mistake because national security comes with assumptions. It comes with lack of accountability. It comes with lack of transparency. And oftentimes it comes for, with lack of security to people who are not major, part of the majority in the United States. And here I'm sort of looking ahead. The costs of the war on terror at home have been borne by minority communities. The cost of the war on terror overseas have also been borne by black and brown people. So I think we have to look at these issues from the perspective of whose security. And then I think the second point I think we need to think about is sort of the classic guns and butter debate. How much money are we spending on these security agencies, whether it's our military or the huge intelligence infrastructure that we've built over the last two decades and really well before that? And, and is that really, do we really need to spend all that money on that? And has that really made us safer? Or are there other challenges that we as a society need to deal with okay. that we would be better off spending sure. that money? But I'm, I'm gonna press you for specifics here. Pretend for a second that you're actually um, working inside the National Security Council or you're working inside a counterterrorism center in New York City. What What is that proper balance between trying to keep people safe and secure, which mm -hmm. is all partly of any government of any sovereign nation, and without sacrificing the civil liberties. How do you recalibrate that as a matter of specific policy in your perfect world? So I think it's actually one very simple thing. So, although it has a lot of implications. So you'll recall that after Watergate, right, um, there was the church committee investigation. We saw the abuses of the intelligence community and the ways in which they had really targeted civil rights protesters, anti-war protesters, et cetera. And after that, the United States 
you know, across its various agencies, really um, constrained the uh, ability of um, law enforcement to gather intelligence without a criminal predicate. So that meant that, you know, you want to go spy on somebody, you want to be reading their emails, you got to have some suspicion of crime, right? It does, it's not a very high threshold, by the way, it's the same threshold that we use, uh, the New York City Police Department used for stop and frisk, it's a low threshold, but it require, it actually constrains intelligence and law enforcement domestically to focus on real threats. I think if we made that single change, which was reversed after 9-11, we would have a much better balance between security and liberty. Um, Spencer, I, I, I said I'd come to you next, but uh, you know, as I'm looking at you, beyond the mustache and the haircut, I'm seeing John Quincy Adams. Um, because if I'm looking for some kind of continuity in, in philosophy and policy, um, you know, in part what I'm hearing is America should not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Um, I, I mean, it, it, if we were, were attacked, what's the proper response? And is that a fair assessment of the balance you're, you're striking to seek going forward? Well, one of the things that I think is important about that question is that we look toward actually reducing the reasons why people want to commit terrorist attacks on the United States. American domination of the world, much as uh, domination by every prior empire of the world generates its own resistance, it will generate an atmosphere in which people will want to come and kill Americans. To stop people from doing that, we have to first take away the reasons why they wanted to do that in the first place. This is not the typical formulation that Washington policymakers, elected representatives, and so forth are willing to accept. But by rejecting it, it puts us in a position where questions like yours torque toward their own answers, which is, well, if only we destroy the Constitution more, if only we reduce individual suspicion for a crime, for detention, for surveillance, for, frankly, brutality more, then we will just get safer and safer. And in fact, all it does is accelerate the dynamic that abroad leads people to want to attack a force that considers, considers itself a global policeman and at home visits increasing repression on its most vulnerable citizens and ultimately scales up to threaten the liberty of all of us. So yeah, don't go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Go abroad in search of solidarity, in search of allowing people to live a thriving life to live a life of dignity, a life of prosperity, without the structures of American power inhibiting that. Yep. But Jane? Well, uh, yes, I agree with that part. Uh, and I also agree we have serious problems at home, but I don't agree that uh, it's all rotten to the core. I just don't. Uh, ben Franklin once said, he that shall surrender uh, security for liberty deserves neither. I may have garbled that, but that's essentially it. And my point over years, including in my book, is that security and liberty are not a zero-sum game. They're a positive-sum game. We get more of both or less of both. And I do think we have made positive steps, starting with what, what uh, Faisal was talking about, to remind, after the Church Commission, we passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. And we set up the intelligence committees on the Hill. And they supervised FISA warrants for years until the thing became too big. Uh, uh, and what I'm saying is after 9-11, after what I call a bloodless coup, where Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld with the Office of Legal Counsel were coming up with new laws outside of FISA, which I didn't understand until uh, they were made uh, uh, public by President uh, Bush 43, uh, Congress came back and, and forced these new uh, policies into FISA. You can say that justifies the police state. I didn't see it that way. I just don't see it that way. Uh, but the, the, the other thing that happened is when we did reform the intelligence laws, we set up the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which unfortunately has not played the role we imagined, although it did uh, review the two big surveillance uh, policies and help us understand what was wrong. One of them has been fortunately uh, repealed. The other one is still alive and well, but under constraints. So 
I, I maybe I'm more of an incrementalist, but I see what's good about our evolution. And I think there is certainly room to reclaim it. And I do, uh, Spencer, agree with the last thing you said, that with the world community, we need to embrace goodness and opportunity and, and, the, and offer the welcome mat rather than uh, project something else, which is why I think we're all in agreement that we have shortchanged our short power over many years, uh, our, our, short, soft our soft power, <laughs> and it is now time, past time, to reinvest in that. Right, to, the, to the extent that we've got a Venn diagram overlap of agreement between Jane Harmon and Spencer Ackerman, I mean, th that alone is worth the price of admission, people. Um, <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth, I, I want to give a question where we've got people's questions coming in. Please post them in, but we've got some good ones. I want to give this one to you um, because, and I'll just take a brief moderator's prerogative. One of the issues of withdrawing from the world, and there are different ways to do it, soft power, hard power is a given, is that there are other nations who I think have uh, even less demonstrated respect for international law, order, human rights, and human dignity, let's just say China, who are looking to fill said vacuum. That's just a real politic reality. Um, and, and it may be at best be counteracted, you know, through soft power and, and multilateral coalitions. But, you know, you know that better than anybody. Uh, here's a question uh, to you that touches on that. The counterterrorism folks of U.S. strategy over the last 20 years has been a distraction from other threats like climate change and the rise of China. So what do you think should be the focus of U.S. strategy now? I'm going to come back to that refrain of engagement with the world to address mm -hmm. using primarily soft power and also you know, economic leverage, but positive economic leverage, not you know, sanctions and uh, finger wagging. But we need to work together, you know, leading a global coalition to, uh, to focus on issues like climate change, like uh, global health. We need to recalibrate. I, I like what Faisa said about you know, national, this focus on national security really does kind of um, uh, short change what a lot of these issues are that we should be focused on, but you, you can couch all of this in national security terms. I mean, the change in climate is one of the biggest threats that we have, and we cannot address it with our military. We're not going to you know, kill that out of existence. So I think that the, the next stage is for us to be leaders on that and to not try to out China China which is something, you know, a disturbing trend that I'm starting to see is people saying, well, China's building all of this infrastructure, so we're going to do our Build Back Better World program. Maybe that's, you know, I think that there is something to, to working in countries to help them address some of their fundamental challenges that will help them become more stable and prosperous. But this idea that, well, China's doing it, so we should too, really undercuts what the United States brings to the table. We are very close to losing our grip on this on this advantage that we have, but the world still does tend to look to the United States for these values that we espouse. So I think that we should be, you know, out there promoting um, you know, through soft power, not hard power, out there promoting free press. Which, let's say, if you had a free press in China, we might have all learned about the COVID nineteen pandemic before it got um, out of control. Mm -hmm. To promote things like, um, you know, helping democracies that are fledgling get to the next step rather than trying to you know, militarily force uh, a democracy on new countries. But we can use that, um, that appreciation that people have for what America is you know, through um, education, information, bringing more students to the United States. That's a place where we've really fallen, uh, fallen afoul. And that's one of the cheapest, easiest ways to build appreciation for the American approach to the world. Uh, so I think that it's, it really is about looking at what, where we have strong suits on the soft power edge rather than looking at, well, if China's going to do it, we need to find a way to do it too. So there's a con there's a consistent theme I'm hearing from all of you, uh, which is that we, we need to do a better job of living our values, projecting them abroad through soft power, not hard power. But there 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 are limits to that. Um, and and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But I've got a question and Jane, I'll give this to you. Given the estimate US military spending is 394 billion, how can Congress continue to justify that with all the problems at home? This is a perennial uh, question. It's a perennial complaint. Sometimes easier said than done to cut the budget. But I mean, are we spending too much on, on the military in your estimation? Well, and I, what think, practically I think the figure is twice that, but I, I may misremember. Maybe others on this call know. I mean, we spend more on our military than all the rest of the world combined. And do we spend too much? My answer is... Yes, and we spend it in the wrong ways. I mean, we should spend it on a military to fight and win future wars, 
not past wars. And mm. uh, I was pretty hypocritical about this in Congress. That's in my book, too, protecting all my military assets in my aerospace dependent district. Uh, oops, yes, I did that. Uh, but I did want to protect the intellectual base that can think ahead. And that's what we need to do. So what's the exact right amount for our budget? The exact right amount is the exact right amount. We really need to uh, reassess, and I think everyone would agree on this, where the military tools, hard tools, could or should be necessary. Uh, I think reducing drone use is a good idea. It creates, as everyone has said, a boomerang effect, which means we are making more enemies than we're taking out. Uh, I do think that, that reducing military missions and having Congress, hello Congress, uh, design a, an AUMF for the future and repeal the threadbare 2001 AUMF is also important because the public then has a voice. And I think surging our soft power budgets, if, that is if we ever have a budget, if we don't default on our debt, uh, you know, oops, that uh, is, is also critical. So um, my answer to the questioner is uh, we need to spend the right amount. We're probably spending too much. Okay. Uh, question for Spencer. Uh, what would be your advice on how America can stave off the retreat of democracy and the rise of authoritarianism that challenges world order? Yeah. So um, many, many things. Um, I, uh, yeah. Um, so first as an immediate priority, given uh, the democratic emergency that the war on terror uh, provides, uh, to authoritarians, the, the, the ways in which the tools of the war on terror from surveillance uh, to detention to deportation um, allow this authoritarian panoply and possibility, that's all got to go. Like structurally, those tools have to be broken. Those authorities have to be repealed and uh, authorities um, to prevent their recurrence um, strengthened. Um, a lot of times, this reverts to a really specific blueprint uh, called the United States Constitution. And beyond <laughs> that, um, I think that uh, we have to recognize that you can have an oligarchy or you can have a democracy, but you will not have both. Um, a lot of the history of the United States is a history of oligarchy, often brutally enforced, portraying itself as a democracy. I, you know, personally, I am a socialist. I think that you cannot uh, have true democracy um, in this country without having basic economic democracy, where people get to decide for themselves how they benefit from the wealth that they produce, rather than capital taking the wealth that they produce and deciding how much of that they can benefit. You don't have to agree with me on that to recognize that we live in a circumstance in which there is real democracy for those wealthy enough to be listened to by this current system. If we don't get rid of these constraints on our democracy, we are not many years away from a successful coup, whether the sort that took place on January 6th as an attempt, or as we're learning now from uh, the former president's attorneys, how to make sure um, another bloodless coup doesn't take place. We're really at a point of emergency. And if we don't act with that kind of urgency to ensure that our futures really are democratic, not just democratic in the terms of our current um, ossified, stale, and I believe actively harmful political system, then we're going to find ourselves very rapidly in much more, more uh, circumstances. Can, can I, I'm going to ask you a, a, a difficult question intentionally, but as a real world application of, of your values, and you're very focused internally, right? No, heal thyself, understandable. But um, let's say that, you know, in the next decade, China attacks Taiwan and tries to take it back. In your worldview, Spencer Ackman, what should the United States do? The United States should work to resolve this conflict diplomatically. The United States should not go to war on behalf of Taiwan. The United States should not involve itself in either a hot or a cold war against China. That is going to replicate the problems we have seen in the war on terror and beyond. It's not going to alleviate them. Okay. Uh, Faisal, I'm going to give you this question. Um, uh, this person says, I have what might be considered a controversial question after the events of January 6th, the Capitol. All right, I want to stress this is not me asking this question. Are right-wing Americans the new Muslims in the U.S.? 
Will the domestic security state erected after 9-11 that disproportionately and wrongly targeted Muslim Americans and Islamic immigrants now concentrate on people from red states and rural areas as domestic security threats without sufficient evidence of criminal conduct? No, um, I, I, I think that um, there's, a, there's a big difference between Muslim Americans and um, sort of white supremacist violent actors who are currently being targeted. The first is um, they are, you know, part of the majority of this country as opposed to an identifiable and demonized minority. Um, it is a population that has significant political support, um, both as is in Congress and then in the states, etc. So they, these people have a lot of protections around them. So I don't think that they are going to be placed in the same position as American Muslims and then you know people of color have been over the last 20 years. But I, I, I think it's important to keep two things in mind. One of the mistakes that we made in the war on terror is that we called it terrorism, but refused to recognize that it was basically political violence. And so you have two elements to that. One is a political element and one is a violent element. And as a country, we never really try to deal with that political element. And I don't think we should make that same mistake when we're looking at what's happening right now. Yes, there's a lot of violence. Yes, it's really terrifying to see neo-Nazis marching on the streets in the United States. At the same time, you know, there are, there's a political element here that we have to address. And lastly, I, I, just, can I just, let me press sure. you on that. Um, because the, 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 the parallels could go any number of different ways. But you basically what you're saying is when you're dealing with neo-Nazis, we need to, to borrow a phrase, we need to understand why they hate us. And then do what? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. All I'm okay. saying is that this goes back to the conversation around root causes that I think Spencer brought up earlier as well, which is then when you're looking at a violent movement, you obviously have to deal with the violence, right? Like that's your, your short-term priority. But you at the same time have to recognize the political, economic, and social structures that have led people to this violence and figure out how you address that issue. Now here, we have a really complicated situation where you have a political movement that is, you know, is supported by people in power, which makes it particularly dangerous, but also makes it particularly political. So I'm never saying that, you know, you've got to try and understand them. Of course you have to try and understand them, right? Like you cannot deal with an, um, an opponent if you don't understand where they're coming from. So mm -hmm. I think it is always necessary, but it's also necessary in the short term to protect the people who are being targeted by far right violence. So you've got to be able to, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. Sure, sure. Well, and, and, and you know, and, and by the way, I was thinking specifically of the Unite the Right rally when I, I set up that straw man for you. But, um, uh, you know, doing both, dealing with the political and the violence, I mean, you know, that would apply mm -hmm. in any given scenario, which I think gets us back to what's the right calibration to protect people mm -hmm. uh, after a, a spate of, of, of terror attacks. Now, we've got only a few more minutes. Um, I do want to challenge us uh, because I think we're, we're in a moment in the withdrawal of Afghanistan. You know, there was a lot of people who said America don't care, doesn't care about Afghanistan. I think, I think Americans do care about the way the withdrawal occurred. Mm -hmm. and, and you can point to 125,000 people evacuated in a short period of time, but you know, uh, that, that clearly has left uh, a, a, a mark on the American psyche. And there's a tendency, I think, at this moment to also 20 years later, um, look and say that uh, American po American policy in 20 years after the attacks of 9-11 were a disaster and that America has squandered or lost its moral authority in the world. Now, some people uh, might say that America never had any moral authority in the world. Um, I would say that, you know, certainly after the Second World War, America and its allies um, were a force for good. Right. Um, how does America rekindle um, that moral clarity, recognizing that the world is a dangerous place um, and that soft power can't solve all problems. Elizabeth, and then Shane. Sure, I'll just start by saying the way to do that would be to follow the playbook that President Biden set up in his UN speech this week. If we were living up to what he laid out in that speech, I think that we would be well on our way to returning, you know, whether it's moral authority or Perhaps it's more appropriate to call it moral currency because it's not something that we're necessarily 
you know, can always control an O, but we had that moral currency after World War II and we used it quite effectively for some time. And we could do that again if he lived up to what he had said, which is, uh, which he repeated, using, uh, you know, relying on relentless diplomacy, working closely with our allies and partners to address global threats, you know, and being a leader in that space. So we can do things like being a real leader in vaccine diplomacy across the world. We're promising some, it's still not enough to actually meet the moment. We could do it by you know, meeting the moment on climate change as well. So we're gonna find out if President Biden uh, really does plan to follow through with that because he was saying very similar things six months ago as well and hadn't quite lived up to it. So I think that you know, those scars of kind of the departure and the way we left Afghanistan, we could overcome if we start living up to that, but it's gonna require, you know, not just um, relying and falling back on uh, military strikes at, at any casual occasion that we think makes sense, it's going to require having some accountability over that use of force. Because, I mean, you're right, there are threats in the world and we're going to have to do them. But how we approach them and how well we approach them with our friends and partners across the globe is going to uh, do a lot to show the rest of the world, you know, whether or not we're going to live up to that promise again. Jane? Well, it's not all up to Biden. I actually agree with everything Elizabeth said, but I'd point out two things. Number one, on 9-11, we came together. I know it's hard to remember 20 years ago, um, but I do. America was under attack. Nobody said this party screwed up, that party screwed up. Uh, I remember because I was walking toward the dome of the Capitol when it was closed, which I thought was outrageous, given the fact that Congress should you know, we take an oath to provide for the common defense. But that was when we thought the fourth airplane was headed toward it. And actually it was headed toward it. We would have had a continuity of government problem then. But at any rate, we got the government reopened. We all, I know this is just a metaphor. I wish it were more. Stood on the steps of the Capitol, uh, those of us who were there and saying, God bless America, holding hands. Nobody checked whether the, the guy, woman next to us was our party or some other party. The entire world offered to help us. Iran offered to help us. Cuba offered airspace. I mean, just think if we had seized the moment. So, okay, 20 years later, uh, we are fractured. We have the toxic tribalism that exists in Afghanistan. How is that possible? We're almost the mirror image in each party we have this. Um, I come back to Congress. Well, maybe that's because, uh, you know, so much of my blood is and treasure is left there. Uh, but Congress is failing in, in so many ways uh, to take to seize the opportunity. And this horror about the debt ceiling and, and, and the budget is an example. I mean, if, if we can't get past that, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic and I'm the one who started out being the optimist. But Congress has to help Biden succeed. And not just Biden, it's not because Biden's a Democrat. Well, let's go back to who Biden is. Congress has got to help sanity succeed and putting country over party succeed. And actually, fine, if, if Congress is better than Biden, yay, good for Congress. But that's where we are. And I think, you know, the clock is ticking. I think all of you would agree with me. And, you know, are we gonna set an example or are we gonna go deep down into the biggest hole we've ever been in? Well, um, among other things, I think looking for Congress for sanity is not what most people do in recent uh, years. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and certainly there is reason for concern, but I think there is uh, even more of a reason to, uh, take the lessons of, of the mistakes of, of the past to find some successes as, and what's worked as Elizabeth suggested, uh, and to try to apply that going forward. I, I'm heartened that there has been, um, there's been some real com common ground in this conversation, despite, I think, you know, a divergence of opinions. Um, that America needs to do a better job of living its values, that that's in some ways our best defense, that soft power uh, should be expanded, that hard power should be used more sparingly. Um, and that, you know, our civil liberties, uh, to go, this goes without saying, uh, are, are a core part of our values. And, uh, and, and any retreat from those ultimately makes us less safe. Um, it has been an hour. It has been a pleasure to talk to all of you. Uh, Elizabeth, Spencer, Jane, Faisal, thank you to everyone who's watched. Please buy their books. They're great. Um, and thank you all for this conversation about America 20 years after 9-11. Take care. All right. All right. All right.